before for you. Okay. So last week, we have talked about the dynamic programming solution for pairwise sequence alignment. And given a scoring uh, matrix or scoring parameters, match score, mismatch score, and a linear gap penalty model, we haven't talked about the solution for how we can extend this to the affine gap model where gap, insert, uh, gap introduction and gap extension are uh, two different penalties. So this, by using uh, this solution, we will not be able to do that because we are just doing making local choices where I put a gap here. I don't care whether there was this previous score was obtained with a gap or not. All right, or uh, for that, uh, there is actually a way to uh, do the best alignment by using an additional matrix, uh, the affine gap penalty. You can take a look at solutions that are on the web, but you're not responsible from that. Uh, in this course, in this introductory course, we're just going to focus on the simple algorithm uh, that uses the linear gap penalty, which means that uh, gap uh, insertion, um, introduction of a gap, okay, uh, and uh, extension of a gap are have the same penalties. Now, uh, the dynamic programming solution is simply the, these recurrence relations. So whenever you see a dynamic programming algorithm, uh, you will be given basically not a pseudocode, but a recurrence relation like this. Uh, this recurrence relation is the entire algorithm. And it also uh, indicates here what these terms mean. So uh, in this recurrence relation, we have this F function, this S function, which takes uh, two parameters. And this one also takes two parameters. So what is the difference between F and S? It should be given in the algorithm uh, by describing them what they are. For example, this uh, lowercase s, a, b, is the score of aligning a and b, where actually it's not complete for sake of uh, space here on this slide. It's the score of aligning a and b, where a and b are individual single nucleotides or single amino acids, uh, which means that or one of them is a gap which means that the score is basically your input, your scoring matrix, or whether your match, mismatch, score, gap, penalty. This is that lowercase s is that uh, scoring uh, mechanism, scoring parameters. And f here is defined as the optimal similarity of the prefix of, so from one to i, this should also be described. This should indicate, so a with these parentheses index from one to i means that the uh, characters, this is, defines a substring of a given string A from between these two indices, one and I, which means that uh, the pre prefix of prefix of uh, A, which contains the first I characters, and this is the prefix of the other sequence, which contains the first J characters. So it's like FIJ is defined as the partial similarity score, which uh, gives us the best, way, best score of aligning the first I characters against first J. So given these things, the solution, the dynamic programming solution is basically this recurrence relation, which tells you everything you need to know about how to compute uh, F, M, N, if you're interested in the first M characters against first N characters of the other sequence. Okay, in order to compute F, M, N, uh, you need to solve this recurrence relation. This is a recurrence relation because uh, it contains recursively the same definition of F, but as you can see, of a smaller instance, it's not the same fij otherwise we would be stuck in an infinite loop if it's if i just so uh, in a dynamic programming or in any recursive solution uh, given a smaller instance of a problem to us uh, as a solution so solution of a smaller instance so this is a solution of a smaller instance it has one less character this one also has one less character this has one less character in both sequences so these are smaller sequences for example if you don't know how to align a b with uh, or a g with t t for example if you just get rid of one of the characters it just reduces to a single character alignment and it may be easier to do that so this is basically using that and as you can see any dynamic programming solution uh, for in other problems you find uh, will have this form you will not see any pseudocode how to use this but if you know dynamic programming you will understand that uh, for example having these two parameters uh, you will fill a two-dimensional partial scores table for example if, if there may be another dynamic programming solution in which uh, we have three parameters in that case we are going to be filling a three-dimensional matrix 
or maybe a dynamic programming solution with just one parameter, a single array, a single partial scores array. Uh, so th this basically tells you how you're going to compute these. And uh, this also tells you uh, it's how, what, what is the way to fill uh, these, the table, partial scores table. So we have talked about this last time. We have went over the code. There was uh, just a, a for loop, uh, two for loops uh, nested uh, to fill in this matrix started, starting from the initial cases. Okay, so we fill, uh, we fill the, uh, this matrix bottom up uh, with the base cases, the first F00. So this is F00, this is F0i. The first row is indexed as zero. The first column also has index zero. So this is zero i's. And so this is J zeros, all, uh, all the, this is the first column. As you can see, if you fill in from this matrix, you can also uh, try to guess what the scoring parameters were. Uh, for example, is this, uh, what is the gap penalty? If you take a look at this matrix, you can guess what the gap penalty is, right? It's not that difficult, it's minus eight. So two times gap penalty, three times gap penalty, four times gap penalty. So what does this mean? What, what does this cell tells me? It tells me what is the best way of aligning H, E, A, G again, against an empty string. The only way to align H, E, A, G against an empty string is gap, 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 four gap. And that's your score. The score of four gaps is four times minus eight uh, is minus 32. So there is only one way to trace back to do the alignment now very good so what about the uh, thanks i guess so what is the match mismatch penalties is there a single match mismatch penalty or are we using some blossom 62 uh, or pam 250 with different match and mismatch scores between different characters so let's, it's, it's really good exercise to play detective with uh, like uh, try to figure out what what's happened here Okay, so, but what I can see, for example, here is uh, it may be single. You're right. So, uh, so we need to look at all the entries or or find one thing that contradicts our claim. For example, uh, in terms of match scores, uh, we see that this two, if this is a global alignment, the only way this two is obtained here in the last bottom right cell. Let me, by the way, try and increase the mouse pointer size to four and also yeah if you look at this uh, bottom right cell two this two cannot i mean if it's that if it's not semi-global alignment if it's semi-global alignment this two could be obtained from this two at above okay because in semi-global alignment we're not penalizing going down in the last column or we're not penalizing going right in the last row uh, but if it's if it's not semi-global alignment if it's a regular global alignment this too cannot be the result of choosing this one or this one as the maximum why because if you choose this one as the i mean two plus the gap penalty should be written here if the gap penalty is minus eight choosing the option i mean choosing the path from a bow should result in a score of minus six, not two. All right. So the only way we obtain this two is also if this path minus eight plus minus eight, it should be minus 16. So choosing this path from the left is minus 16. This path is minus uh, six, uh, but we have two here. So which leaves us with the only possible option. The two should be a result of this. So which means that a match of an A with an E with an E should be plus six, okay? Uh, so our match score is plus six from minus four. It will increase uh, the score from minus four plus the match uh, score, it will lead to six. Okay, can we have something else uh, that shows the match score is six or something else? For example, this is a, oh yeah, actually we are using uh not single match scores i can see right here in this entry at four minus four look at this minus four it's surrounded by minus 15 minus 28 and minus 19 which 
all three of them are much smaller than minus four. So it means that again, we can not use the path from above, path from left, because it will even increase what we have we have there. So if you use choose the path from left, it would be minus 23. I don't see minus 23 here. And if from the path above, it will be minus 36. All right, 28 plus 8, minus 8, 36. So it means that we are coming from this path and an increase from minus 19 to minus 4 means that a plus, a max score of 15. Okay, so yeah, uh, so so we have a match score of 15 here with tryptophan to another tryptophan, which are uh, very, uh, these are uh, uncommon amino acids in na nature. So trying to align them, trying to give higher match scores to them is uh, possible. So we have plus 15 here. So let's see, did we have any matrices that I showed which had plus 15 for tryptophan? So plus 11 here and plus 17 here in PEM250. So actually, we're not using any of these two matrices. Maybe another version of Blossom or PEM is used in that example. All right, so. But uh, you may also try to find inconsistencies on this one. For example, if, if the match between tryptophan and tryptophan is plus 15, it should be plus 15 everywhere. So actually, I only have only these pairs of tryptophan, so I cannot change this. I cannot check its consistency elsewhere. But what about um, there's another E and E here? Uh, it was plus six before, right? So we can check whether it's really plus six here as well. And we see that it's from minus two to four. Yeah, plus six uh, to E to E. So uh, so different match scores are used, which means that different mismatch scores are also used. Okay, so mismatching between if the match score between amino acids is different, we are probably using a scoring matrix like Blossom or PEM. And uh, in Blossom or PEM, we have different, if we see that it's a different match score between, it also uh, probably, most probably, is there will be different mismatch scores between different amino acids. So you can uh, do similar analysis in different cells, but let me tell you, in, not in every cell, we may uniquely find which path to tra trace back. There sometimes there may be multiple ways to align the two sequences that result in the same optimal score, which means that, uh, uh, for example, if mismatch penalty is exactly the twice of gap penalty, uh, you would replace any mismatch with two gaps, which will result in the exact same score. So, which means that both of both ways, in terms of which, which one is better, uh, no, no, none of them is better. All of them are the same uh, quality in terms of the optimality. Uh, our algorithm will treat all of them same, maybe choose randomly among these multiple things. But what I'm saying is that, if you remember, we're choosing this max here. If any two of them or, or all of them uh, it, it, if more than one uh, of these three entities here, they are equal to each other, then we are trying to choose the max. If we have ties to choose the max, then it means that the alignment is uh, will will produce multiple optimal alignments exist. There is no single optimum alignment. There are multiple optimal alignments that result in the exact same score. This is what it means. All right, so, and also last uh, week we talked about a variation of these global alignment, uh, this global alignment algorithm, which was the semi-global alignment first. Uh, if we don't want to penalize the gaps at the end, which we call the terminal gaps. If you don't want to penalize the terminal gaps, it means that you're free to introduce any gap in the beginning with no penalty, which means that you, you will start your scoring with zero at the first match or mismatch. Okay, it may be a negative thing if it's a mismatch, but all the initial gaps and the gap at the end, we don't want to penalize it. And the way to do that is to just ignore, not penalize going down in the last column, not penalize going right in the last row. Also the first row and the first column, they are all zeros. We may start our alignment anywhere uh, in, 
in any one of those columns and also we may start our alignment alternatively any one of these rows so this is called a semi-global alignment and why do we need such an alignment uh, sometimes we are aligning a very short sequence against a very long one and we may still want to uh, globally find that short sequence among the uh, um, inside the other long one and in that case uh, we want our goal is to globally align the small one but the other one is only going to be matching partially to the uh, smaller one uh, so uh, this is like this is called semi-global and we don't want to put gaps at the ends in that uh, case because we are bound to if we, you're one of the sequence is very short the other is very long you're bound to have lots of gaps at the end in glo original global alignment everything is a match every every one of the characters in both of the sequences are match against things so uh, this is the final alignment is shown as two sequences of equal length uh, with these gaps uh, and don't want to uh, penalize that up here at the end and uh, now I'm going to quickly talk about another uh, version, uh, which is local sequence alignment, which is used a lot actually, uh, because uh, especially when you're uh, analyzing the relationships between very divergent sequences, uh, sequences which share only 10%, 15% similarity, and there are only uh, similar regions locally in both of the sequences. Uh, for example, it may be some important biological domain, uh, like, uh, for example, as some ligand binding domain that is uh, in the shared in both sequences, but otherwise the sequences are completely different. In that case, if you want to find this short but conserved sequence in both uh, of them, you want to do a local sequence alignment. Uh, in local sequence alignment, the problem seems to be much more difficult because we're not, uh, we're trying to find all possible substrings that match between these two. And uh, so here is the problem. Given two strings, so this is the formal definition uh, of length M and N, find two substrings in x prime uh, which let's name them x prime and y prime whose similarity they are, which means that their optimal global alignment value we are going to globally align only some substrings and there are uh, many substrings that i mean you can match again exponentially many different substrings between each of the, each uh, between these two okay uh, so, for example, look at the CCC, GGG, uh, appears exactly in both of these sequences, but the other parts may be very different. You'll get, all get mismatches in, on both ends, but there is a local, highly matching region in both of them. So, can we find um, the substring which will get the largest score possible, okay, uh, between considering all of such substrings? This seems like a a more difficult problem than the global alignment problem because we're not just uh, trying to find the single the whole sequences any substring could be our uh, aligned two sequences so it seems like the our search space is increased uh, but the modification to this actually uh, the, to the original algorithm is very trivial i mean the the implementation is very trivial uh, but Finding the algorithm may not be so uh, trivial because it has a the algorithm has a different name and it was uh, found. Uh, let me see. I think it was at the end history of, of these alignments. Yeah. So the global alignment algorithm that we described, uh, the dynamic programming, it's also called Nidelman Wunsch. The Nidelman Wunsch algorithm was uh, proposed in 1970 by Nidelman and Wunsch. That's the our global dynamic algorithm. The local sequence alignment algorithm that, that solves the problem that I just described is also called Smith-Waterman. Uh, and uh, it was uh, published 10 years after the global one. Uh, it may not be because the algorithm was difficult to find. It took 10 years. It probably was, there was maybe no motivation, uh, biological motivation to solve the problem local, for, to solve the pro local sequence alignment problem. 
when uh, they didn't have that many sequences back then. So remember, all these are before we had these uh, sequencing boom at the 2000s. All right, or even yeah, 19s, 1990s, we had lots of sequences too, because this BLAST is a, a algorithm to search the database of sequences. All right, but this, as you can see, it has a different name, uh, Simit Waterman. So it is a different algorithm, but the extension of our global sequence alignment algorithm to, to solve this problem is really trivial, well, maybe even more trivial than the semi-global alignment extension. The, so here, the, if you again try to visualize the problem, how it looks like, if there's a certain region in the alignment which gives you a negative score, another region, the total part is, I mean, look at this path. The alignment path, the, the sub, sub parts of the alignments, we know that the alignment is additive. We can just chop the solutions into pieces and compute the scores in those pieces and add them up to get the optimal score. So the total, total score of this global alignment is 35. But there's a region here, this green region, uh, which scores 50. So it's possible to get a higher score by just considering part, this substring with this sub, the alignment of this substring with this substring here. And uh, this is what we are looking for, uh, a local alignment with a higher score. And the way we, to do that is this, okay? It's the exact same recurrence relation. The only difference is that the entire first row and the entire first column is all zeros. We don't put the gap penalties there. This doesn't mean that the gap penalty is zero. We still have the gap penalty, okay? We are using, again, uh, this is, again, the solution for the linear gap penalty model. We still have the gap penalty, uh, but the first entire first row, first column are zero, which means that it's like semi-global alignment you're free to start your alignment anywhere you don't need to penalize terminal gaps i mean the initial gaps and one thing that is interesting here in this other part is that we have these three things which are exactly the same terms the three terms that we are looking at to select from max and we have an additional term in our recurrence relation which is zero that zero is an additional term what does it mean it means that it if any of I mean, if all of these choices are negative, which means that the alignment, aligning of those first part results in a negative score, you're free to start an alignment fresh at that point, at zero. Zero gives you the freedom to say that, okay, I'm going to start my alignment at, at, these, uh, at this point from, as, from fresh. I'm going to ignore the first part with a negative score with a mismatch. So you may argue that what if that negative score is going to be turned into something positive later, uh, but it may be turned into positive later, okay, but uh, instead of choosing something negative at that point, if you just started saying that I, let's, let's chop this part of the alignment and just look at the score at this alignment, it's always going to be larger than the one in which you had the negative, okay? So in other words, some score S minus a negative score is always smaller than s plus zero okay s is going to be larger than that so th this is exactly what what it what it what is it tries to do if the score below, falls below zero at some point uh, you are free to start a new alignment at those amino acids or nucleotides at inj from scratch so, and this is not the only modification. I mean, the modification is really easy. So this will give us the local sequence alignment, but uh, there's one difference. Uh, actually, let's try to do it for, the, for these uh, cases, uh, for these sequences. The match, panel, match score is four, mismatch is minus two. We have a linear gap model uh, with gap penalty minus one. Okay, so we have an interesting case here. Uh, the mismatch penalty is exactly twice the gap penalty, which means that any mismatch can be replaced by two gaps. We will have the same exact uh, score. So there will be al three alternative alignments, probably. We'll see. Uh, if we have a single optimum alignment, which contains a mismatch at the end, there are two 
additional versions of that with, with gaps actually we'll uh, we'll see that so if we uh, take a look at this we have uh, we fill the first row and first column with zeros and this is the whole matrix that is filled as you can see there are no negative entries here whenever we fall below zero we can just say let's put zero there okay because that's one of the options in our recurrence relations so this first of all kv and eqll the first the score of aligning kv with eqll is zero which means that we, we just ignore eqll and kv mismatch part mismatching part so when we are starting a new alignment with uh, k and l here which is three like this okay so this three actually is the path to three i think it's uh either it may be from here okay it may be so zero four 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 three so we need to trace back this three correctly this three doesn't come from a mismatch of k with an l all right so what how how can we obtain this three here the only way to obtain this three here is to follow this path which means that this three you cannot start oh, okay from zero to three let's k and l we start our alignment with a k and l mismatch you, you would be wrong because this tree that you see here under my mouse point, pointer is from this four on the left hand side since gap penalty is minus one four minus one gives us three it cannot also come from above uh, or or this one so this is four and where did we obtain this four it's this l and an l match so the alignment actually start ignoring kv and eql and start with ll so this this part but is this really the, the another interesting thing in dynamic programming partial score matrix is that we we fill in all these entries which contain which all the possible ways to align these sequences all the possible best ways to align but some of these cells will may may not be used in actual alignment solution when we are doing the trace back so uh, what i mean is that if you look at this example for example look at this minus three does it mean that we are going to match a with an this a with this a to get this minus three because yeah from minus eight we jump to minus three here the minus three comes from here but this this part of the matrix that you filled is not part of the optimal solution it may be is the solution that says uh if 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 you want to look at another alignment in which these two a's are matched the the second a in this sequence and the first a in this sequence are matched if if that's, if that's one of your constraints i and i want my alignment to end that and at that point what is the best way to align the first parts then you can start at minus three and try to do a trace back but when we are saying what is the best way to globally align both sequences this is our trace back and as you can see the trace back does not touch many of the cells we have filled which means that we have filled these cells for uh, the case that potentially they may lead us to this too but they didn't all right so but uh, we can this shows that we, we we consider all the possible ways of uh, aligning these cases and considering all the possible ways is just a polynomial space for us and polynomial time uh, we can do that efficiently all right let's if we come back to here in this case okay I, this four and three may not be part of the solution the another thing we need to do in local sequence alignment is that the we are not we will not be looking at this bottom right cell anymore to see our optimum results because remember in local sequence alignment our goal was find the substring that ends in the highest global alignment score so what we will be doing is that we will look at the entire matrix and find the maximum value in that matrix which is this 14 which tells you that after this 14 the score drops to 10 if you go all the way to the end just as we we can ignore the initial part of the sequences this kv and eql this eql and this kv they are ignored okay this four basically tells they're ignored just like that we can also ignore the end of the alignment which means that we don't need to go all the way to the bottom right in local sequence alignment we will stop our alignment 
or we will uh, vice versa we will start our trace back at the largest value in the table which is 14 so the result of the optimum local sequence alignment actually is 14 and then we do a trace back from 14 to 0 until we reach uh, 0 which you see that this 4 is not touched at all so it's not uh, this ll match that gives us the optimum score in our alignment is actually the match of this l with this l the the first two l's here in the second sequence are not used the best way to locally align them or to align the, 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 the third L in the first sequence against this first L. And if you, if you try to do the trace back uh, from 14, this 14 is obtained from this four, this 10 from this six, this six from this two. So we have match, 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 three matches, one match, second match, third match, this F E L, we are going right to left when we are doing the trace back. And when we come to this two, this is the part where we could have obtained this two from all, all three possible neighbors are plausible candidates to obtain this two. Which means that we can either go this way, this way, that, or we can directly go from this two may have been obtained from this four because mismatch penalty was minus two. Okay, so this A and V, uh, instead of having these two gaps here like this, we could have just put A and V on top of each other as a mismatch which will give us the exact same score and we stop our alignment as soon as we hit zero after this kk match from this four to zero so this four is obtained from a kk match from zero to four and when we reach zero we stop tracing back our alignment we are not interested because this zero means that we started alignment at that point so trace back should stop and these are the two possible so this is the other gap one uh, the gaps could be uh, could swap places easily and we can also have a mismatch they all have the same score of 14 okay so i will leave uh, this uh, example to you and you can uh, find lots of other examples on the web if you want to practice uh, how this works uh, but we rarely fill the table are by hand. So this is just to understand what is going on uh, in dynamic programming. Uh, but we just write a program, the code that I showed you last week to, to solve this. Uh, all right, any questions from uh, dynamic programming solution? Uh, the good question. So depending on whether you're local using local alignment or global alignment, should we change the scoring matrix? very good question so uh, this depends on whether biologically uh, a local match between two sequences uh, require different match mismatch scores i mean biologically a local similarity does it have amino acids preferences different or nucleotide preferences different than in the case where we have a global match um, I don't think so. I mean, we already make assumptions about um, like everything is local, things like that. But uh, the some distinction between local and global, I don't, I have never seen a case where the scoring matrices are changed due to whether you're doing global or local. Uh, but if you're doing global, maybe you can, maybe the gap penalties could be played with. You may have less gap penalty if you're doing a global alignment. Uh, but in, ter in terms of match mismatch, I don't think match mismatch scores would change. We would still have the mass ma ma same match and mismatch scores, but gap penalties maybe if you you may want to tolerate the gaps more in global alignment. Uh, but really, the 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 reason we, sometimes we use global alignment, sometimes local alignment comes from the biological problem. If uh, in global alignment is usually used, if you know there are, these sequences are closely related to each other, the entire sequences, they are, uh, you, you have high confidence that they have high sequence similarity, at least 80%, for example, uh, globally. And if you have like 10 such sequences that are all at least 80% similar to each other, uh, 
and uh, that's when you use global alignment most of the time but these days i mean other than that if you just don't know uh, anything about their uh, total sequence similarities or uh, you don't have any idea about any similarity when you are searching for a sequence using local sequence alignment is the preferred way to go because uh, you first these are the local sequence alignment is your initial uh, alignment that you start from you find some concert region and if that local sequence similarity is statistically significant enough it may be an indication that these two sequences or at least that part of the sequences may be related i would imagine to use local sequence alignment in a way that for example even if when i'm aligning two long sequences maybe finding multiple local aligning regions between the pairwise uh, two pairs of sequences so what i mean is that for example 14 was uh, a nice sequence after i aligned this part k l e f aligned with v oh, okay so most of the sequences are already gone but imagine uh, this local alignment was part of a very long uh, protein sequence there may, this may be one similar region between those two there may be Another pair of uh, substrings, which are also, uh, maybe they obtain a score of 12 in another place of the, that sequence. So I think it will be nice to have like, uh, I mean, probably local sequence aligners do that uh, these days. Um, uh, maybe I can, uh, I, I think I gave this uh, as an assignment. Progr the first programming assignment was something like that. I mean, it's not very difficult, but after you, the, the only thing is after you can probably not use the same matrix or you may use the same matrix, but you need to mask, mask out all the rows and columns that use this alignment to find another alignment in this matrix, which is like an, another local sequence match between these two sequences with, with also the second best score. For example, we obtain a score of 12 here, okay? But does this mean there is another local sequence match in another part of the sequence with score 12? No, because this 12 is actually also using this 14 here. If you mask out the regions that already use these uh, letters, L, K, L, E, if, the, the, if this, this part of this five amino acid part of the uh, sequence is used, okay k a, this part and the five sequence here after these parts are removed can you find the second best local alignment or third best uh, because when you have long protein sequences they may have multiple concert regions which locally match very good okay so the algorithm that we described here finds the best one best local alignment what if we uh, want to modify this algorithm to find the top three local alignments which are disjoint top three disjoint local alignments meaning that as i said the, after you have the top local alignment those parts of the sequences are done with we are done with that those part of the sequences find the next uh, sequence alignment in the other part one way to do that is to rerun your algorithm on the uh, I mean, after we remove this column and the, uh, the rows and the columns, the R sequences are chopped into two pieces, right? The first part, uh, so th this, this alignment is like uh, a gap. Uh, I mean, it, it just divides the remaining part of the sequence as the left part of the alignment and the right part of the alignment. Then you can maybe uh, do run the local sequence alignment again on those parts from scratch. To find i think probably you may need to do that because the partial scores table really depends on i mean if you just remember if you mask these parts out if you take them out this eight is no longer meaningful starting an alignment at this ge for example you should again start from zero uh, so you probably need to rerun the local sequence alignment algorithm, the Simit Waterman algorithm, on the first part and the second part separately to find maybe uh, the second best one. Does it mean that the, you have found the second and third best one if you run the uh, both sides? Not necessarily, right? Because the third best 
may still be this on the same side as the second best. So you may need to, this is like a, tr uh, a branching tree, like a binary tree. Each one of those local alignments chop your sequence into two parts and you continue looking for the second best uh, and then third best. I think in order to guarantee the, the top three local alignments, we need to have a tree like this. Let me just use this. So this is your best local alignment first or top 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 first okay so this is your top local alignment after you have this local alignment the strings both uh, proteins are chopped into two the left part the left sequences and the right sequences so what i mean is you you run your local sequence alignment again on these two parts and the maximum of these two uh, whichever it is, for example, let's assume this one is the higher one. This is the second best local alignment. This becomes your second best if it's larger than this one. Okay. What I was asking was, can you just say, okay, this should be the third best then? Can we say this? Then my answer is actually, the answer is no. Because after you after you take this part out and this one also divides the sequence into two parts the left part is now divided into again two parts due to this alignment and your third best can uh, be one of these two okay uh, so we are not third best in other words is going to be one of these three things so you can actually uh, so if you're looking for top five alignments for example you may need to uh, further do the alignment maybe uh, different so if if you want to look for top k alignments uh, the number of alignments you may need to perform uh, may be exponential uh, in k okay so this may be a nice extension probably some there may be some tools here but by using uh, the local sequence alignment and trying to find the top three best local sequence alignments uh, by repeatedly uh, running the local sequence aligner. Uh, there may be other solutions that you may think of. I mean, this, this is just one solution that I just came, uh, came up with. Uh, there may be another way to actually mask these parts out. Maybe there may be some intelligent ways to reuse parts of the previously computed scores here. Uh, because after maybe just changing them for example, if, if this is 8, just subtract 8 from every one of them. And if it's below 0, then, uh, or I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, these are just some other ideas that, that you may have. It may, be, it may be more efficient than, there may be more efficient algorithms to find the top 3, top 4 without actually running the entire alignment from scratch all the time. Because these parts contain the masks uh, after you take these parts or the other parts contain some information and you may be repeatedly uh, obtaining the same information by running those local sequence alignments, aligners from scratch. But definitely you need to do some score correction. That's uh, all right. So this is a local sequence alignment and uh, there here are some local sequence and global sequence alignment results between real sequences, hemoglobin, beta chain, and alpha chain. Uh, so these are the paradox, the duplication. Uh, when this global alignment with end penalty and no end penalty. So this is the original global alignment. This is the global alignment, semi-global alignment, and this is the local alignment. So the uh, sequence alignment of the human hemoglobin beta chain against itself is given. So it's the exact two sequences, exactly the same aligned with respect to each other, which means that it's a perfect match all the time. So the 725, the first row is put there to show you what is the maximum score you could have obtained if it was a perfect match. So it's like a reference, all right? So we need a reference like this, especially when we're just looking at row sequence scores, because the 725 will have no meaning 
I mean, it will indicate, for example, if you can, if you have very long sequences, and if uh, the largest score you can obtain is like 10,000, 725 means uh, not a good match. Yeah. But really, with no references without the length of the sequences or your maybe your scoring matrices. Imagine I multiply my scoring matrices by 10. All the match scores are multiplied by 10, which will also inflate your row scores. So these scores by themselves, they don't mean much uh, if you don't uh, know the length of the uh, your sequences or also what your scoring match mismatch scores are. But that's why this first row is given to you as a reference. So the alpha chain and beta chain, they have some similarities, but they have lots of mismatches too, as you can see. We cannot obtain some value, almost half. So we get half a score of what we'd obtain if it was a perfect match. And this is the human also contains myoglobin. Uh, so it, uh, another protein from the globins family, uh, but for specified... Uh, I mean, it, it's specialized for a different function, probably. And uh, this is these are other organisms, chicken. So when you do a global alignment with chicken, uh, we see we get a negative score, no matches at all, all negative scores. But the terminal gaps, if you just ignore them, it increases to a positive. And if you find local similarities, it's even more. Okay, so this one shows uh, sometimes there may be local matches uh, so epidermal growth factor precursor the global alignment is really negative or uh, uh, and and with no end penalties we can get to a positive score but there are local regions which are similar between these two sequences which are homologues of each other they are related functionally and both of the algorithms we have learned, the local sequence alignment and global sequence, the dynamic programming solution is OMN time and OMN space. It takes OMN time to fill in the matrix and it, it takes this much memory, this much space to have the entire table uh, in memory. So it's a polynomial uh, quadratic uh, time complexity and space complexity. If we don't want to do the trace back if only the score or distance is needed. The space could be reduced to the maximum, so it could be reduced to a linear complexity. If you're especially aligning very long sequences, this quadratic, quadratic space and time complexity seems like, okay, it's very efficient. Uh, I mean, if you're, uh, but uh, if you're trying to align whole genomes, unfortunately, these time, time and space complexities are prohibitive. Uh, they, uh, if you're trying to align uh, a three gigabase genome with, uh, for example, another one gigabase genome or a three gigabase genome with a one megabase uh, genome, uh, it may be prohibitive. So I'm going to talk about that later. So there are some improvements to the original algorithms, but the algorithms we have seen in class are this. Now, here is, uh, after this slide, I'm going to have a 10 minute break. Look at this. I mean, this is called, considered an efficient algorithm, this quadratic algorithm. But even if both of them are just one megabase genomes, in, which means that it's much smaller than a human genome, which is 3.2 gigabases. So uh, one megabase, one million uh, nucleotides in both genomes. They are like maybe the genomes of some bacteria. Uh, so we are trying to uh, compare these two. If we are going to use integers to indicate our st the scores, an integer is like occupies four bytes by default, we would need four terabytes of memory. Okay, actually I prepared these slides like 10 years ago. Four terabytes of memory is still a lot, right? I mean, does anybody have a four terabyte memory machine at home? Oh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot, right? I mean, we have like maybe uh, like 16 gigabytes of memory uh, or 32 gigabytes of memory. If you have a nice machine at home, it's 32 gig. You don't have 128 gigabytes of memory. Uh, but as the distinction between the speed between uh, RAM and uh, solid state disks are diminishing, you can you can use solid state accessing solid state disks. Or I mean, uh, our SSDs are also faster. But still, four terabytes is a lot. Okay, just to align these two things, just to have your table stored in memory, 
you would need this much memory. It's still prohibited. So this slide did not get old in outdated in the last 10 years. Uh, this CPU may be a little bit, uh, I mean, we get higher CPUs or we, we can do it in parallel maybe if we can. But if, you, if you're just using a single thread to uh, and a, you know, a single thread machine, it will take 10 days. Much, I mean, 10 days is still doable, but it will not, you will not get the result in an instant. You will need days to align these. So, and these days we have uh, some sequence search needs like this. We have a large sequence and we want to search it against the entire nucleotide database of all the sequence, uh, the DNA, genomic sequences of all the organisms that are sequenced, uh, viruses, bacteria. So in order to be able to perform such a query, uh, we would need many days if you're just using uh, the dynamic programming uh, solution. Therefore, we need other solutions, heuristics, uh, which will speed this up. And one such algorithm is BLAST. BLAST is like the de facto uh, search engine for biological sequences. So it's like Google for biological sequences. If you have a new sequence, you BLAST it. So BLAST is also made it as a verb into the English dictionary. Actually, it's, a, it's already a verb, uh, another meaning. So the blasting, so uh, just like an explosion or blasting of a ro rocket. But here, BLAST as the oh, heuristics can also be paralyzed and they are, they are paralyzed. So the, the, the blast, but I call it a heuristic in the sense that it doesn't guarantee the optimum score or it, does, it may sometimes get, uh, it's based on some certain assumptions. For example, good alignments should have exact matches of certain length. Uh, for example, if uh, you have uh, a hit actually in the database, but with, with no exact matches of that length, BLAST is going to miss that. BLAST is starting with the uh, assumption that first, let's f find an exact by, by using some hashing techniques. Uh, it finds those exact matches really fast. Uh, it doesn't require uh, any uh, dynamic programming alignment to find those exact matches. After finding those exact string matches, it extends left and right with gaps. And uh, so this, this is what, why it's an heuristic. And this extension of finding the hits can be parallelized. So I think uh, BLAST is, using, is a highly parallel algorithm that you, we use. And, uh, as I said, it made into the English dictionary as blasting a biological sequence means that just look Googling how, how Google made into the English dictionary, Googling something. So you're Googling a keyword uh, while you're uh, doing something and you're blasting a sequence when you're a molecular biologist. All right. So blast nucleotides. If we go, so this is the website of blast. It's basic local alignment search tool. So it's not just pairwise alignment of two sequences. Uh, it's uh, uh, searching against the database. You can run standalone versions of BLAST on your own machine, on your own database, and there are different versions of that. But I will talk about the basic BLAST algorithm and what we are going to actually use from BLAST. Uh, oh, they're not relational databases. Uh, the databases are just uh, very long sequence databases with some um, indexing techniques that, uh, for example, preprocess uh, those databases for words of fixed length. For example, for nucleotides, I think it's 11 nucleotides. So if you have a data, if you have the original genomic sequence of the uh, entire nucleotides of the uh, entire genomes of organisms uh, building a blast index means that uh, for a certain score scoring mechanism you go over your entire database and extract uh, i mean by sliding a window of size 11 over uh, on the, those genomes and index those 11 length nucleotides store them somewhere and store with the information saying that in this genome in this position there is this 11 length nucleotide okay so they're not relational databases at all so it's they're using some indexing te techniques uh, for specialized for strings
So many different tools uh, they worked on in order to run fast, they have their own indexing strategies. And sometimes in order to be able to use that tool, you have to get your um, original FASTA sequences, original nucleotide sequences, and first run the indexing preprocessing part of that tool to get your index. And that index is most of the time larger than the size of your uh, total number of nucleotides, uh, but it contains some other information which will help you speed up the, uh, the other, uh, the search process. Okay, so we are going to take a look at this blast, how it works. Okay, and let's have a now a 10 minute break. I'm going to stop the recording. So it's 10.38 now. Uh, we will meet at 10.48, okay, in 10 minutes.